Mm. Is the tanpura fine or is it too loud? It's fine. Sounds fine. Okay. I'll I'll be singing a composition of Sri Kanaka Dasa in the raga Hamsa Dwani set to Adi Tala. ನಮ್ಮಮ್ಮ ಶಾರದೆ ಉಮಾ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರಿ ನಿಮ್ಮೊಳಗೆ ಹನ್ಯಾರಮ್ಮ ನಮ್ಮಮ್ಮ ಶಾರದೆ ಉಮಾ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರಿ ನಿಮ್ಮೊಳಗೆ ಹನ್ಯಾರಮ್ಮ ಕಮ್ಮ ಗೋಲನ ವೈರಿ ಸುತನಾದ ಸುಂಡಿಲ ಹೆಮ್ಮಯ್ಯ ಗಣನಾಥನೆ ಕಣಮ್ಮ ಕಮ್ಮ ಗೋಲನ ವೈರಿ ಸುತನಾದ ಸುಂಡಿಲ ಹೆಮ್ಮಯ್ಯ ಗಣನಾಥನೆ ಕಣಮ್ಮ ನಮ್ಮಮ್ಮ ಶಾರದೆ ಉಮಾ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರಿ ನಿಮ್ಮೊಳಗೆ ಹನ್ಯಾರಮ್ಮ ಮೋರೆ ಕಪ್ಪಿನ ಭಾವ ಮೊರದ ಗಲದ ಕಿವಿ ಕೋರೆದಡೆಯನಾರಮ್ಮ ಮೋರೆ ಕಪ್ಪಿನ ಭಾವ ಮೊರದ ಗಲದ ಕಿವಿ ಕೋರೆದಡೆಯನಾರಮ್ಮ ಮೂರು ಕಣ್ಣನ ಸೂತ ನುರಿದೇಟ ಚಂದ್ರನ ಧೀರತ ಗಣನಾಥನೆ ಕಣಮ್ಮ ಮೂರು ಕಣ್ಣನ ಸೂತ ಮುರಿದೇಟ ಚಂದ್ರನ ಧೀರತ ಗಣನಾಥನೆ ಕಣಮ್ಮ ನಮ್ಮಮ್ಮ ಶಾರದೆ ಉಮಾ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರಿ ನಿಮ್ಮೊಳಗೆ ಹನ್ಯಾರಮ್ಮ ರಾಶಿ ವಿದ್ಯೆಯ ಬಲ್ಲ ರಾಶಿ ವಿದ್ಯೆಯ ಬಲ್ಲ ರಾಶಿ ವಿದ್ಯೆಯ ಬಲ್ಲ ರಾಶಿ ವಿದ್ಯೆಯ ಬಲ್ಲ ರಮಣಿ ಹಂಬಲನುಲ್ಲ ಭಾಷಿಗನಿ ವನಾರಮ್ಮ ರಾಶಿ ವಿದ್ಯೆಯ ಬಲ್ಲ ರಮಣಿ ಹಂಬಲನುಲ್ಲ ಭಾಷಿಗನಿ ವನಾರಮ್ಮ ಲೇಸಾಗಿ ಜನರ ಸಲಹುವಕ್ಕಾಗಿ ನೆಲೆಯಾದಿ ಕೇಶವ ಲೇಸಾಗಿ ಜನರ ಸಲಹುವಕ್ಕಾಗಿ ನೆಲೆಯಾದಿ ಕೇಶವದ ಸಾಕಣೆ ಅಮ್ಮಯ್ಯ ಲೇಸಾಗಿ ಜನರ ಸಲಹುವಕ್ಕಾಗಿ ನೆಲೆಯಾದಿ ಕೇಶವದ ಸಾಕಣೆ ಅಮ್ಮಯ್ಯ ನಮ್ಮಮ್ಮ ಶಾರದೆ ಉಮಾ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರಿ ನಿಮ್ಮೊಳಗೆ ಹನ್ಯಾರಮ್ಮ ಕಮ್ಮ ಗೋಲನ ವೈರಿ ಸುತನಾದ ಸುಂಡಿಲ ಹೆಮ್ಮಯ್ಯ ಗಣನಾಥನೆ ಕಣಮ್ಮ ನಮ್ಮಮ್ಮ ಶಾರದೆ ಉಮಾ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರಿ ನಿಮ್ಮೊಳಗೆ ಹನ್ಯಾರಮ್ಮ ನಿಮ್ಮೊಳಗೆ ಹನ್ಯಾರಮ್ಮ ನಿಮ್ಮೊಳಗೆ ಹನ್ಯಾರಮ್ಮ thank you thank you very much that was young rahul vellal from bangalore he is uh, one of the very very good upcoming young artists of uh, carnatic music 
she is also learning mridangam and the piano and you will see this little one all over uh, practically all over the globe uh, sharing his art with us namaskar swagatam and welcome to all our distinguished guests and audience from around the world to our annual event namaste 2021 a global utsava of indian soft power brought to you by the center for soft power which is an arm of the indic academy in collaboration with the iccr today is a very auspicious day when we honor the snakes that support farmers and keep the balance in nature it's called nagapanchami and incidentally it is also garuda jayanti celebrating the king of birds he is considered the power behind movement and also represents inner freedom what a wonderful way to begin celebrations of our uh, uh, independence day with uh, garuda jayanti because today is garuda jayanti and here we are talking about external freedom while with garuda jayanti we are talking about internal freedom and they say that the flapping of his wings creates the sounds of the salmon which is the samaveda that is the wisdom of life and garuda bears on his back mahavishnu the sustaining force of the universe we are delighted to present to you a range of themes from ayurveda to music to vedanta and much much more the festival will extend between august 13th and the 29th as we begin the 75th year celebration of independence of india through this festival we would like to engage with all of you on topics that are critical to humanity and how we can together work to find innovative solutions by our culture to bring a deeper understanding of a culture and the knowledge she bear holds in her bosom that is valuable to all of mankind india before history was ever recorded has shared her knowledge for the benefit of humanity and she still continues to do so we will be also launching my india quest an app based quiz contest in collaboration with life cycle and my in the quiz will be launched on the 15th of august with interesting book awards from indic book club now we will have vicky cage who is a grammy award winner a us billboard number one artist unesco and mgiep ambassador and unicef celebrity supporter he is an internationally renowned indian music composer environmentalist and professor Ricky has dedicated his life and music to creating awareness on the environment and positive social impact. He has performed at prestigious venues in over 30 countries including at the United Nations headquarters in New York and Geneva. If I keep on telling you about Ricky Cage it will occupy the rest of the evening so I will stop with this. Now I invite him to give us the meaning of a Sanskrit poem that was specially composed by dr shankar raja raman who is a scholar a poet and an author and uh, he he is uh, traveling today so we will have jyoti recite the poem and ricky will uh, give you the meaning of the poem now over to ricky and once again welcome to you all and a very special welcome to the uh, israeli consular si kobi shoshani who is with us and has been kind enough to except to stay for the rest of the event also even after his talk so once again welcome to you all and over to ricky now thank you thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and really honored to be here with all of you <clears throat> and uh, today uh, jyoti my very good friend for many years is going to be reciting this sanskrit shloka which is so meaningful in today's context and i will be translating so uh, jyoti uh, welcome and uh, jyoti you can get started ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಪ್ರತ್ಯಭಿಜಿಜ್ಞಾಸಾಮಹ ಸ್ವಾತಂತ್ರ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣತಾ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮ ಕ್ಷಣವಿಹಿತ ಕ್ಷಣ ವಿಘೃತ ಕ್ಷಣ ಸಂಹೃತ ವಿಷ್ಟಿಪಶ್ರೇಣಿ ಮೇ ಬಿ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಅ ಟ್ರೂ ನೇಚರ್ ಆಫ್ ಫ್ರೀಡಮ್ ಆಬ್ಸಲ್ಯೂಟ್ ಕ್ರಿಯೇಟರ್ ಸಸ್ಟೇನರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅನ್ ಹೈಲೇಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ಇನ್ಯೂಮರೇಬಲ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಮೋಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಮೋಮೆಂಟ್ ಧರ್ಮಾರ್ಥ ಕಾಮ ಮೋಕ್ಷೇಶ್ವನ್ಯತಮ ಸಾಧ್ಯತಾ ನೀತ್ವಾ ಜೀವದಶಾ ವರ್ತಯತ ಸ್ವಾತಂತ್ರ್ಯ ಫಲತು ಪುರುಷ ಮೇ ದ ಕಾನ್ಶಿಯಸ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ಸ್ ಎಫರ್ಟ್ ಟು ಫ್ರೀಲಿ ಪರ್ಸ್ಯೂ ಎನಿ ಆಫ್ 
of the four goals of dharma, artha, kama, and moksha by assuming humanhood be fruitful. And then the refrain. Pratya bhijagnyasamaha swatantrayam purnata lakshma. May we remember our true nature of freedom absolute of absolute freedom. Thank you. That was the shloka. Uh, namaste, everyone. Thank you, Ricky and Jyoti, for that beautiful rendition. I now take pleasure in introducing Sri Dinesh Patnaik, who was supposed to join us this evening, but due to an engagement at the Prime Minister's office, he was unable to join. Um, Sri Dinesh Patnaik is the Director General of the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. He is a career diplomat of the IFS for over 25 years of experience in a variety of interesting and challenging assignments. He has served in Indian missions in Geneva, Dhaka, Beijing, and Vienna. Although he isn't here with us today, he will join us another day. He has sent us a short video message. Um, Kodiji, can you please share the video with us? Thank you. Namaskar. I'm delighted that the Center for Soft Power is holding Namaste 2021, which is a global utsav of Indian soft power. I normally don't like the word soft power, I'd rather call, call it soft influence or soft diplomacy. But soft power is being used all over the world now, so we might as well use it. Where India is concerned, we have a plethora of soft power assets. Soft power which ranges from uh, our cultural and civilizational heritage to cuisine, to films, to dance, to music, to this there's immense variety in the soft power, including our democratic system, our election system, science and technology, you name it. Anything which makes or has a soft influence on people, making people understand India and understand the depth of India, how India is a force of good in the world. This is important to understand that that is soft power. And I'm glad that the Center for Soft Power is holding this global itself of soft power to discuss all this. Because I have always maintained that soft power is mostly soft power assets. What we have, whether it is, uh, like I told you, the cultural and civilizational heritage, science and technology, our tourism potential, whatever it is, these are soft power assets. In the end, they can only become soft power if we are able to work together to convert them into power. Assets don't become power. So this conference becomes important because this discusses how can we use the assets that we have, our heritage, our culture, our traditions, to actually convert it into soft power, where we can influence countries, where countries look up to India as a source of aspiration, where we move forward and uh, stamp our viewpoint on the world, where we set the agenda of the world and where the world understands that where India comes from, it's coming from a place of good, coming from a place of caring for the world into making the world a more sustainable, equitable and equal world. That is what we need. And this conference, I am 100% sure I part participated in the last conference and there were some brilliant discussions there. I am sure this conference will also bring out some brilliant discussions which will take us forward and which will help us define how we define our soft power and how do we convert those soft power assets into something which is a long tangible influence across the world. So I wish the organizers all the best. I regret that due to other circumstances, I was not here for the beginning. I shall participate in one of the uh, conference schedules. I will find a date for it. But I wish uh, Vijay Lakshmi ji and her team all the best. And I'm sure you will have a great conference. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Namaste, and uh, I would like to uh, introduce Sri Prasenjit K. Basuji. He is an economist and a historian and has spent the last 25 years analyzing Asia's economies for le uh, leading international banks. He co-authored a small book, India as a New Global Leader, in 2005. He is also the author of Asia Reborn, the first modern global history of the whole of Asia told from an Asian perspective. Apart from an in-depth understanding of Asian economies, he has an excellent understanding of key emerging and frontier economies in Africa, Europe, and Latin America. 
he will be steering the conversation today and uh, will be uh, we are grateful to him for helping us conduct this session basuji namaste over to you namaste uh, so i i will uh, start by just giving a, a brief perspective on uh, india soft power and its influence on the world uh, and then i'll introduce uh, the other wonderful speakers that we have on the panel uh, for this session um and each of them will then present for about 10 minutes uh followed by uh, a discussion among the four or five of us so if you think about india's role and influence in the world soft power is the way india has had a huge influence across the world through history starting with the first known civilization uh in india the what is called the indus saraswati civilization it more or less invented the idea of urbanism and urban planning the sort of urban planning that is evident in the indus saraswati cities is absolutely remarkable and i think uh, some modern indian cities would benefit from uh, the ideas that that came from that great civilization 5000 years ago uh, and then of course uh, around the same time we had the great itihasas the uh, what are called the epics the ramayana and mahabharat which continue to influence large parts of the world when yale university started a, a new campus in asia in the first semester every student is uh, is introduced to the ramayana because the ramayana is to is today a central aspect of not only the civilization of india but across across east asia whether you go to cambodia uh, if you go to the royal palace of cambodia the the walls are filled with what they call uh, the murals of the rama kirti uh, in in the wats of thailand uh, the rama kien as they call it is uh, is a central aspect on all the great walls thailand is supposedly buddhist again the influence of india on uh, their primary religion but the the uh, the influence of the ramayan is also very central and then we had of course uh, the mahabharat also if you if you go to the center of jakarta uh, the capital of indonesia there is a magnificent statue that is called the arjuna vijaya statue right in front of the central bank in jakarta uh, and it shows sri krishna and arjun essentially at the start of uh, the bhagavad gita so uh, the influence of the mahabharat and ramayan are pervasive across asia and of course uh, uh, if you think about the vedas and the vedanta the influence of the vedanta on philosophers from schopenhauer and many other great uh, uh, philosophers of of the last uh, three or four centuries have hugely been influenced by the vedas and vedanta and then of course we have uh the other enormous uh, uh resource yoga we now have a world yoga day on which yoga is celebrated around the world so uh, it is now already recognized beginning to be recognized as an enormous uh resource for the world and it is a resource that india has essentially presented to the world uh and i think just as important as yoga is the role of sanskrit the sans if you think about uh the influence of sanskrit on the languages of the world not just in india but in points west and points east the influence of sanskrit remains enormous uh in fact it has recently been discovered that the maori language and the language of the hawaiians were also have uh, sanskrit influences and not only of course those but if you if you look at the malay language or the language of indonesia uh, the the influence of sanskrit is, is deep why is that because india was a great trading civilization throughout history there was a tremendous amount of trade that uh, that india undertook and as part of that trade india's uh, cultural assets were spread across uh, both east asia as well as west asia we think about the kushan dynasty of ganeshk 
that, uh, that Kushan dynasty had a huge influence on what is today called Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, etc., uh, and also uh, what is now called Xinjiang or East Turkestan, uh, the, the uh, westernmost province uh, of China. And of course, yeah, Tibet uh, and India are very much part of the same uh, great civilizational expanse. Then if you think about uh, the Guptas and, uh, you know, first of all, the, the Kushans established Takshila, the first great university uh, that the world has, has, has knowledge of to, to this day. Uh, the Guptas established, established Nalanda in the fifth century, so some 1500 years ago, and Nalanda became, made India, in fact, a hub or repository of the world's knowledge, and the world came to India to learn at Nalanda. So, uh, and Nalanda existed for at least uh, six or seven centuries. During the Pala dynasty, there was Apart from Nalanda, there was Vikram Shila, there was Odantapuri, there was Jagadal, and there was uh, Somapura. So there were five great universities that attracted students from all over the world. In fact, in Nalanda, there was uh, a Sri Vijaya College. Sri Vijaya were the people who were ruling uh, uh, what is today called Indonesia from Sumatra. They also covered uh, they also covered Malaysia, uh, what is today Malaysia, and that that was uh, uh, that region. The, M the king of the, the Srivijayan Empire established a college in Nalanda for his students to keep coming. And not just that, at any given time, there were there were at least three hundred students from uh, from China, from Korea, from Japan, and from as far away as Greece, as well as uh, the Abbasid. There were people from the Abbasid Caliphate uh, that came. To, uh, to Nalanda to study uh, during, during that period. So India was then a hub of knowledge. But if you go back to the Guptas, the Gupta period was, uh, was really the golden age of India in some ways, because it created so much great knowledge that India gave to the world. So starting from the invention of the zero and the decimal system, uh, from measuring the circumference of the earth. So Aryabhatta and uh, Brahmagupta had measured the circumference of the earth. They knew gravity. They knew gravity about a thousand years before Newton's famous apple moment. They had described it. They had, they had uh, mathematical treatises on it a thousand years earlier. And of course, uh, they had measured the circumference of the earth. If you measure the circumference of the earth, you of course know that the earth is round. And this was something that Europe didn't discover until about a thousand years later. So this is this historic legacy is part of the cultural uh, and civilizational uh, assets that India has had and has given to the world. So uh, uh, today we celebrate Garuda, but in Indonesia, the airline, the national airline is called Garuda. Uh, and I'd say one other aspect of India's cultural uh, influence on the world is the huge importance of uh, India's ability to live with nature. Throughout our history, our civilization has lived with nature and has had tremendous respect for nature. So environmental awareness is absolutely consistent with the basis of our civilization. Uh, and then, of course, if you go back throughout history, uh, even uh, 2,500 years ago, there were democracies in India. Uh, that tradition was part of different types of traditions uh, of Raj Dharma. But one of the, one of the traditions of Raj Dharma was, was democracy. And that democracy is today an integral aspect of modern India. That too is part of India's current soft power asset. So all of this, we uh, use, we have always used soft power to engage with the world. The only known invasion was the Chola invasion of Srivijaya in 1025, but that was invited by the Cambodians. So you have 
if you look to the Pallavas, the influence of the Pallavas on the use of language, the use of scripts, uh, the Thai script, the Cambodian script, the, the, uh, the Burmese script, all came from interaction with the Pallavas. Uh, when Magellan, the, the, the explorer who's supposed to have been the first European to circumnavigate the globe, he didn't quite do it, but when he, when he died in, um, in the Philippines uh, at an island called Mactan, he was there uh, confronted by a Chola. There was a Chola king, Sri Lapu Lapu, who defeated Magellan. So the influence of the Cholas, the Pallavas, the Palas, the Guptas, they all had tremendous impact through trade. And then there was later the Marathas. And interestingly, even Islam came to Southeast Asia from India. Gujarati Muslim traders brought, uh, brought Islam to Indonesia. So the influence of India, the soft power has been enormous. And I think that is something that we can continue to build on. So uh, as, a, as a historian by passion, I thought I should bring in some of the historical perspective, but we have a wonderful panel of tremendous speakers. So I will, uh, I'll quickly try to introduce uh, uh, the other speakers who will be speaking, uh, speaking uh, in turn. Uh, first of all, uh, we, we are very privileged to have uh, Mr. Kobi Shoshani, currently uh, the Consul General of Israel in Mumbai. He is the official representative of the State of Israel in Maharashtra, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, and Goa. Prior to this appointment in Mumbai, Mr. Shoshani has visited India several times in the past. In 1992, he was sent for a six-month period right after the establishment of full diplomatic relations between India and Israel. Uh, and he took part in forming the embassy uh, in New Delhi. Kobi had been sent by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, of Israel to Mumbai right after the 26-11 terror attacks in 2008, and he subsequently came also in 2018. So he has a tremendous amount uh, of, uh, uh, of links to India. Then we will have uh, uh, Mr. George Brooks, a saxophonist, composer, and educator, He's a prolific and diverse saxophonist and composer, uh, acclaimed for successfully bridging the worlds of jazz and Indian classical music. He's a founder of Indian fusion groups, Summit with Zaki Hussain, Steve Smith, Kai Eckhart, and Fareed Haq, Bombay Jazz with Larry Coriel and Rono Mojumdar, the Raga Bop Trio with Steve Smith and Carnatic guitarist Prasanna, and Elements with Indian violinist Kala Ramnath, and Dutch harpist Gwyneth Wentick. Uh, George Brooks was introduced to Indian classical music and became entranced by its melodic beauty, rhythmic complexity, and deep spiritual core. After graduating, Brooks traveled to India, where he met master vocalist Pandit Pranath, the giant of North Indian music, who deeply influenced pioneering composers Lamonte Young and Terry Riley. Brooks immersed himself in study with Pranath cooking and caring for his Guruji in exchange for knowledge. This, of course, is the traditional Indian style of learning known as Guru Shishya Parampara. Then we'll have Dr. Sheila Patel, Chief Medical Officer of Chopra Global uh, and a board certified family physician. For more than a decade, she practiced full spectrum family medicine from prenatal care and deliveries to ER coverage and inpatient and outpatient primary care for all ages, and currently maintains an outpatient family medicine practice in Southern California. She joined the Chopra Center in 2010 and helped run the Perfect Health Program and provided Ayurvedic consultations. She speaks at Chopra Global Events and is a lead educator for the Chopra certification programs. So, uh, and then of course, you've already heard from, uh, from Ricky, Ricky Cage, and I think we should also have Dr. Shankar Rajaraman, who is a Sanskrit poet, uh, Chitrakavya, mathematics and meter. He, uh, he's a psych psychiatrist by training and a Sanskrit poet by passion. So uh, without further ado, let me hand it off to Mr. Kobi Shoshani, Consul General of Israel in Mumbai. Thank you, uh, Mr. Basu, and, and thank you for introdu the, the introduction. I uh, try to do it uh, less than 10 minutes 
uh, and uh, I hope that uh, it's uh, going uh, to be interesting. I have a perspective of, of uh, 21 days only in Mumbai. But as you mentioned before, I was here several times in the past, and I think that I have a perspective not only about the city, about the relations between India and Israel. Israel. And uh, this, uh, uh, this lecture is going to be about that. But I would like to start with a sentence that I, I think that uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi said when he was uh, the chief minister of uh, Gujarat, that Israel and India has no land connection. But uh, what, uh, what is uh, connect us is the water. And uh, this is something that I like very much because water is one of uh, our uh, main goals here uh, in India. And of course, uh, uh, and of course, uh, to promote uh, the special relations with India. Um, 21 days is not enough to speak about uh, a right perspective about India. But I think that I would like to start, and you mentioned uh, my visit in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Mumbai and India as well. Uh, I remember when I came in 1992 to Mumbai, uh, Bombay then, uh, I didn't see a lot of sky, uh, high sky, high tall, tall buildings in the, in, the, in the skyline. It was uh, the first beginning between uh, the relations between India and Israel. Israel and India is only 30 years of uh, special relation, uh, full diplomatic relations. Then uh, it was quite uh, problematic in the beginning. And when I came here again in uh, 2008, as you mentioned, after 26-11, I saw a big change of, of the city. I saw a huge building, I saw a vibrant city, and I fell in love with the city, although it was not an easy day. I was one month in uh, that, that, uh, that time. I saw the beginning of uh, the bridge uh, that actually connecting uh, the northern part of, um, of Mumbai to the south. Uh, and uh, right now I was see that everything is completely full. Uh, and in 2018, I saw a completely different skyline and, and it seems, and it's connecting to what you said, probably it's a very a change of India in my eyes. And in Hebrew, there is a sentence, which I'm not going to say it in Hebrew, the first visit, the, the, the first guest, see all the good and bad things. And I think that I saw the change that India has passed in the last 15, 20 years, and it's amazing. And I tell you, I'm saying it in a very foreign eyes, and I, you are a superpower and you have, uh, and if we will have time about water afterwards, I will elaborate about the pipes that I've seen uh, in, uh, in Tane district, which is I think something unbelievable. Uh, it, from the different side, uh, I think that Israel uh, different by size and of course by population um, uh, from India. Uh, India is a country of uh, agriculture, 65% of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the nation actually deals directly or indirectly with agriculture. In Israel, it's only seven, almost 80%. Uh, but the connection is calendar. And you are a, a historian, I think, and I hope that I don't make a, make a mistake. The Christian calendar is according to the sun. The Jewish calendar is according to the lunar. And the Indian calendar is combination of the two. Correct me if I'm wrong. And I think this is a bridge between between us and to the the rest of the world, and I think uh, I like it very much, and I, I think that it's a, I'm astronomer as a hobby, and I think that it's a quite uh, interesting. Uh, and, and you've mentioned uh, Einstein, and you, you've mentioned uh, some of uh, Indian influence all over the world. I uh, wrote six or seven points that I would like to mention about India and Israel, and the the connecting and, uh, and important uh, uh, points that it's very important. First of all, we both have an ancient uh, cultures. You mentioned it in your lecture, uh, Mr. Basu, and I think it was very interesting for me, for my ears uh, to hear this uh, lecture, but without understand the history of India and Israel, you cannot understand the history, uh, current time, the political, everything, the life of, uh, of India and Israel. And I think it's, it's truth for all of the countries, but I think in Israel and India, because we are an ancient culture, everything re reflects in these days. That's the first point. The second point is of course the British heritage. 
with the bad and good things, doesn't matter. The influence of the British over the state of Israel and over India, it's tremendous. You can see it in the buildings, you can see it in the bureaucracy, you can see, you can see it everywhere. And uh, although we are, you are celebrating 75 years of independence and we are next year going to, 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 be, to uh, celebrate the 74th anniversary, we are younger than you in one year. I think that the British heritage is um, for good and bad, it's uh, quite uh, amazing. The third thing is the young generation. And we've heard in the beginning uh, the fantastic uh, young musician. And I think that uh, we have in Israel and India, a brilliant young generation. They are smart, they have brains, they are interpreters, they are, they are businessmen, they are, we should give them the work because they know how to, to do. And I think this is a very, a lot in common with India and Israel, we are a very young society. Now, without entering to the political side, I think that there is very similarity between India and Israel. And, and again, I'm not going to enter to the political side. Uh, I'm diplomat and, but I, I should not do it. But, you know, India has been created or, or, or actually founded by a very important uh, party. The, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was, you know, as a, he was a hero. As a, when I was a child, my father told, spoke about him at home, um, uh, Rabin Banat Tagore, of course. But there actually was the founder, the basic founder of, of, uh, of, uh, of the, the nation, of, of India. And of course, in Israel, it was the same thing. It was the Labour Party with David Ben-Gurion. He was actually the founder of the, of the state was amazing. Both of them were very amazing and more than that with a lot of vision. But in 1977, it was transformation from, and the BJP became in power. And it reminds me the same thing in Israel. The Likud party, which is a right wing, came into power in 1977. Prime Minister then was Menachem Begin. And in the recent years, of course, Benjamin Netanyahu that was visited India and, and Modi was visited, the, the, the Prime Minister of India was visited. Israel, uh, which was extremely important in Israel. Then the political uh, uh, situation is quite uh, important. Or even today in Maharashtra, the, the government in the, Maharashtra is, reminds me our government because it's a split of small parties uh, collect, co collected together. Now, the, the borders between Israel and the neighbors and the conflict over the borders here between Pakistan, Bangladesh, it's also very similar to Israel and it makes me, uh, make me very uh, fascinating when I talk about it, but it's the same thing. Uh, the last but not least is uh, the water issue. As I mentioned, water is extremely important. Uh, we, are, we have suffered from a lack of water for many, many years. And uh, thanks God, we solved the problem due to our water management, irrigation system, purification, unused water, which is precedently something that uh, there is one hour that I can speak about it. And we are coming to India to share this innovation and thoughts with the Indian people because water is the source of life. I will do it in a very short uh, way. I don't want to enter to that if someone wants afterwards, I can speak to him and, and read uh, and uh, write him some, something about it. But I was in, in Tane, as I mentioned before, and I saw a huge two pipelines coming from the lakes to the city of Mumbai with 4 billion liter a day coming from this lake to the city. It's amazing. It showed the power of India. And why I'm telling you this story? Because I think that Israel as a land of innovation, I think also India, production, and this is the, my last uh, sentence, the production, the ability to pro produce huge and, and, and open markets, it's here. Then the combination between India and the cooperation between India and Israel is for the benefit of the whole region. And uh, don't forget that together, India and Israel, we are almost 1.4 billion people. We are only 10 billion. Then, uh, let me finish with that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shoshani. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, uh, we now move to uh, 
Mr. George Brooks with his 10-minute uh, talk on, uh, on the topic. All right, well, <laughs> um, that's, quite, <laughs> that's quite, an, quite a pivot for me as a, uh, <clears throat> as a musician to come from a uh, sort of a geopolitical understanding of uh, the relationship of India and Israel to um, my relationship with India, which um, actually goes back now about 40 years. I mean, I first came to India in 1980 and saw a very different, a very different India. Um, Mr. Shoshani was speaking of uh, seeing the changes between the 90s and the 2000s and um, the changes certainly from 1980 until my last trip to India, 2009, 2020, actually, just before the, uh, the, global, the global shutdown. Those changes were dramatic. Um, and, you know, for me, the, the treasure of being a musician is, is really, and, and my particular journey, which maybe I should speak a little bit about, but the treasure of being an artist who travels and who lives in another culture um, is the ability to create a sense of unity. I mean, and this, this conversation is, is about soft power and it speaks about nations and love of nations. But, you know, I'm, I come more from the one planet, one people, one love. You know, that's what we're looking to express as artists. Um, I think we're, we're trying to constantly speak of the commonality of human existence, the, um, the intrinsic desires that that unite all of us and um, I learned quite a bit about that on my first trip I was very young I was in my early 20s I came to um, to I came to New Delhi to study with my teacher who you mentioned Pandit Pranath who was a um, brilliant vocalist and a deeply spiritual man he was uh, born a Hindu Brahmin in Lahore, what is now in Lahore of what is now Pakistan. He came across to India during partition and uh, spoke clearly of, the, of the, the travesty and the devastation of that time period. But he um, became the Shisha, he became the disciple of, uh, of Abdul Wahid Khan Saab, who was a Khayal vocalist. So in his life, he to me, I mean, and, and I mean, he did represent this unity of religions and uh, the statement of the underlying spirituality that that joins um, all people who are seeking to find the truths. And he, his music was that of a spiritual devotion. Um, on his on his uh, altar, he had a Muslim tasbi. He had the Hindu mala. He was a uh, a disciple of of, um, of 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 Sai Baba, Shirdi Sai Baba, who was also in this kind of Sufi understanding of uh, of of the unity of kind of spiritual seeking. So I came to I had already been awakened to this um, kind of search for truth through art, through listening to the great jazz musicians here in America. John Coltrane in particular, whose, uh, whose important opus is called A Love Supreme. So somebody who through intense study of music, intense study of themselves, wants to express a universal truth, which for me transcends um, borders. Now, one thing that I learned by being immersed in, I lived in India at that time, I should say for 10 months, um, I studied Hindi. I learned to read Devanagari script. I learned to communicate at a at a reasonable level. I'd studied for six months before I went. Uh, my Guruji did not speak that much English, so you know it was very helpful in my studies. I mean, a lot of the language I learned had to do with music, 
and musical terms, um, especially around Hindustani music. Um, I was living in Delhi, which is both a you know a cultural center as well as uh, as you know the political center of India. Um, I also one of the things I had to do when I first came was was cook. <laughs> so I learned the language of food. I learned what jira and anya and and all you know I can. I could find my way around a kitchen in Hindi as well as cooking because that was my job for my Guruji. I had to cook for him. I had to massage him. And then, uh, you know, I would be fortunate to receive uh, music from him. So I, um, you know, I was greatly blessed and and I have sought to, to, to unify things. One thing that I learned as I immersed myself in that culture, every time I would come back to the US, I felt like I had to immerse myself more deeply into the culture here as well. Because one of the things I felt I needed to do was bring my musical uh, traditions to India. Um, India has such a rich and much, much older musical tradition than uh, especially jazz in the West, which is maybe a hundred years old, coming from the uh, Africans who were brought to this country. So this constant exchange of information, I think is really one of the great, um, one of the great responsibilities that artists have. And, and, you know, I came to India as a student I lived within that student mind set for for many years. Um, as I said, I was in my early 20s. My first recording as a composer wasn't until I turned about 40. Um, in my days of studying in India, I mean, we saw that brilliant young uh, Carnatic musicians begin begin our 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 session today. F fantastic, but I was and and it's. It's brilliant to see such brilliance uh, in youth. But when I was first introduced to Indian music, they kind, I was kind of told that you really start to make a statement as an artist at a much older age, 30, 40. Then you're kind of thought to have matured and have, have perhaps a reason to present yourself. There will always be um, young young brilliant stars and that and that's very inspiring to us so at 40 i recorded my first album and i was uh blessed to be here in northern california with where ustad sakir hussein was living uh pandit krishna bhat sitarist um and working with artists of that stature kind of brought me to um you know, kind of brought me to a, to, to a certain kind of prominence in India. So I had this gap between the 1980s, returned to India as a performer in 2001, which was um, seeing India go from what felt like the 19th century to the 22nd century in, in a 17-year in a gap. India went from, when I was living in Delhi, landlines hardly worked. When I came back, the rickshaw driver had two had two had two mobile phones <laughs> for for different aspects of of his business and the communication of course made things fantastic the um the ability to travel with great ease and um book tickets online instead of going to the train station and waiting for four hours to buy a ticket so I'm not sure, I haven't been watching the clock, but uh, I don't want to overstep my time. And I would like to play a little bit of music. So yes. in in the many years I've been coming as a performing artist, it's really been um, important for me to give, to share my cultural, my culture's music with the artists in India who are interested in um, in learning how the West thinks about music, composition, improvisation because I have learned so much from Indian music. I've been given so much by so many incredible classical artists and uh, it's a desire to give back. I think you have a video of a group, um, one of the groups I'm very delighted to work with and I feel this makes uh, kind of a nice statement about some of the work I've done. It features a harpist 
from the Netherlands, Gwyneth Ventink, who is a trained as a strictly classical musician, although someone who was also drawn to Indian music in the early part of her life. And I met Gwyneth uh, while we were both performing, excuse me, with Pandit Hari Prasad Charasia, the incredible Bansuri player of, you know, one of the great musicians of the last century. Along with us is uh, the violinist um, Kala Ramnath, who is herself an extraordinary musician, composer. Both of them are dear friends. Kala is an interesting amalgam of what I think makes Indian art so powerful. She, her family is from the South, um, so she comes from a Carnatic tradition, but trained in Hindustani music, and she brings these elements together in a very beautiful way. So this is a piece that um, Kala and I composed together. It's called um, To the Light. It's based in a raga that's known in North India as Rag Patip, and uh, it's in a uh, in a five beat time cycle. So it brings a lot of elements together. I hope you enjoy it. Is somebody going to play that? Yes, good. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you for playing that. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, what, what actually um, links Indian classical music to jazz is the role of, uh, of improvisation. And uh, Indian classical music, of course, has, uh, has a tremendous um, uh, uh, system. It is, it, it is, it is, a, it is a, it's a system of music that is, that has tremendous traditions and so on, paramparas. But, uh, but there is also a, a huge role for improvisation, which of course is central to jazz as well. And so uh, when jazz and Indian classical music come together, uh, what, what emerges is often absolutely wonderful as we just heard. So thank you it so is. much for that. Uh, and uh, I, you know, just to go back to uh, Mr. Shoshani, uh, music, music wise, uh, the great uh, collaboration between India and Israel was between uh, Yehudi Menuhin on the violin and, uh, and Pandit Ravi Shankar on the sitar, of course, uh, from about 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, I think that that produced some, some tremendous innovation and improvisation as well. So on the theme of music, it is uh, my pleasure uh, and privilege to, to reintroduce Ricky Cage to uh, Ricky Cage uh, to, to, uh, to now give us his address and perhaps also let us hear some of his music. Namaskaram everyone. It's uh, such an honor to be here again. And of course, to follow the great George Brooks who I've been a huge, huge fan of and what a great personality, what a life in music. And, uh, you know, and what great music we got to listen to today. He's got such a beautiful understanding of Indian music and culture that uh, very rarely, like, you know, us Indians uh, have, you know, so hats off to him and what a, what a great musician. So, uh, so basically, my, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about music, I'm going to talk about the environment, I'm going to talk about India, but uh, what I'm going to do is that to give context uh, to this, I'm going to speak a little bit about my journey in music, my journey of being an Indian and my journey in environmentalism. So, Ever since I remember, I've always been two things. I've been a musician and an environmentalist, you know, two pillars that have pretty much dictated my whole life and all of my life decisions. And uh, even while growing up as a child, uh, you know, uh, I mean that, uh, you know, my ears were always more important than my eyes. You know, while my classmates were fascinated by television, by cartoons, by video games, uh, for me, the center of my universe was my music system. And I would listen to cassette tapes and records all day long and, you know, and my father had this huge world music collection, not just the pop music of that particular period, but a huge world music collection. And I would listen to music from all around the world, try to decipher which instruments have been used and what kind of cultures do these different musicians come from and what are they thinking while they're creating this music. So a lot of my education has actually happened through music. And it was through music that I fell in love with the natural world. And it's very difficult for me to explain this, but for me, music and nature has always been one and the same thing. Of course, now I've got reasons to explain that because, um, I mean, it's common knowledge now that how did music start? Music started off as sounds from within nature, you know, sounds of the birds, sounds of the animals, sounds of trees, uh, sounds of the wind, sounds of a stream. And, 
you know, and then later on it became humans imitating those sounds and, you know, and making those sounds more pleasing to the human ear and then us pulling out objects from nature like bamboo flutes and, you know, and uh, boxes of seeds and animal skin for percussion and, you know, and then it's only for the last, you know, probably few centuries that music has actually uh, become academic with notes and scales and, uh, you know, and things like that. But but music has always been sounds of nature. And if you look at any kind of ancient Indian culture, or ancient in, uh, Indian tradition or any kind of indigenous uh, culture from around the world, uh, music is still, you know, sounds from nature, which have been sort of imitated at, or being sung about. So, and also I realized as a young child that, you know, I liked hanging around with animals more than I did with humans. So I was quite a weird <laughs> child. And, you know, and, and when my, uh, you know, uh, I would, when my parents and my siblings and my teachers would tell me to run away from seemingly dangerous animals, you know, like creepy crawly animals, like snakes and insects and amphibians and things like that, uh, you know, and they would tell me just step on it, you know, kill it as soon as you see one. You know, I was very drawn towards these animals and I would try to see personality in every single one of them, look into their eyes and see personality. And, uh, you know, and my question to them was always that, you know, if you're just supposed to kill these animals as soon as you see them, then you know, then why do they exist? You know, <laughs> you know they've 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 been here for millions of years. Why do they exist if they're just supposed to be killed? And of course, now you know, after reading a lot of ancient Indian, uh, you know, values and uh, and traditions and texts and spiritual texts, I realized that you know, that uh, that we in India knew long before the scientists now talk about that. You know, that all species basically form an intricate balance. You know, the, an intricate web of life that forms the balance that keeps us alive as humans. So, uh, you know, and nowadays scientists are talking about it, but we've been speaking about that for, you know, the last 5,000 years, you know, like, I remember when I was reading the Mahabharata, I read this passage that said that, you know, that the tiger cannot exist without the forest and the forest cannot exist without the tiger. And I thought that that is exactly what scientists have found today through scientific research, you know. So anyway, so uh, uh, many, many years later, I became a professional musician and how I became a professional musician uh, coming from a family of doctors and an Indian family is, is quite a story in itself, but that's probably for another time. But nevertheless, I became a professional musician and I started off my career doing commercials for television and radio. And in a very short span of 13 years, maybe a long span, but yeah, thir thir in 13 years, I, did, uh, I was fortunate to have composed over 3,500 commercials for pretty much every single brand possible, whether it's Google, Microsoft, Airtel, Vodafone, TVS, Suzuki, basically every brand and their competitor anywhere in the world, I was basically making music for them. And then after doing this for 13 years, it sort of struck me that these big brands are spending like maybe a thousand, a couple of thousand dollars on, you know, on creating a piece of music to sell a product because they're always trying to sell a product. And not only that, they're ready to spend a couple of million dollars to actually put that music on television and radio to sell their product. And I realized that these big brands have understood the power of music. You know, they've understood the power of music so much so that they understand that music is not just a powerful language for communicating a message. And in this case, it was, you know, to communicate a message of sales because they're trying to sell a product. But not only that, but for retaining that message deep into the consciousness of the listener. So, uh, so much so that they're ready to spend multi millions of dollars to actually, you know, to actually use music as a vehicle to actually sell their products. So that is when it sort of hit me and uh, almost as a sudden thought. I decided that I'm going to stop all forms of commercial music. And the only kind of music that I'm going to make is in my own small way and in my own naive way to try to make this world a better place. And since I'm a very strong environmentalist and my music has been reflecting the, my thoughts on the environment from time to time, but I decided that every single piece of music that I make is going to be about things that I feel strongly about. And it's usually about sustainability, the environment and positive social impact. So in 2015, my 14th studio album was Winds of Samsara. That particular album won me my Grammy Award. And uh, that sort of like, you know, gave me a larger platform to do bigger and better things in terms of advocacy through my music. And uh, it, it gave me a lot. It gave me, uh, it, it gave me tremendous potential to take this message of sustainability to a much larger and wider audience. And uh, uh, since then, I've been an ambassador with the United Nations, uh, with various organizations with the United Nations, the Goodwill Ambassador, and I've been, you know, traveling all over the world. In 2019, I did uh, 70 concerts in, uh, in 13 countries, uh, performed uh, three times now at the United Nations uh, headquarters to world leaders. So there are, so basically that, so my music is primarily Indian. It's always going to be Indian because that's how I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just like, you know, that, uh, for a person like me, I would compare myself to, let's say, uh, let's say my grandmother, 
my grandmother when she would she's an extremely good cook and when she would make uh, like a pasta she would make the pasta she would make a pasta which was like true to italian pasta exactly in the same way but when she's leaving the kitchen she would just throw a little bit of turmeric powder and chili powder in it and give it to me you know that's exactly what my music is all about if i if i even try to set out to make music which is truly like a different genre like if it's celtic or if it is um, you know american pop styled or you know or uh, or or a japanese style music there will be some indianness thrown in because without that i would feel like you know my music is naked you know so so that's how my music is and uh, as i said i've always believed that music is a very very powerful language not just for communicating a message but for retaining that message deep in the consciousness of a listener and with all the problems that we face in our world today whether they are environmental problems like climate change which is the biggest existential problem we've ever faced or species extinction deforestation or you know or uh, you know the forest fires that we we've, we've been seeing all over the world or plastics i believe that the biggest threat to our environment the biggest threat to us as a species our survival is the constant thought that we have that somebody else will make a difference you know so we always waiting for governments to make a difference intergovernmental bodies ngos corporations to make a difference when the truth is that the only way we can bring about difference is through behavioral change and to by changing ourselves and and this is not because we are all evil people and we don't want to change ourselves but it's just because we've not empowered ourselves to believe that the small incremental changes that we make within our own lives can actually make a difference and i believe music can be that em- empowering art you know like through songs and through concerts and through recordings you know to encourage everybody that you yourself are powerful if you just make these small changes within your own lives that's all that is required you know and in india with 1.3 billion people if we basically uh, create a more environmentally conscious society in india then basically we are saving the world because all that we need to do is make india an environmentally conscious society and we've pretty much saved the world and you know and with all the and where music comes in is that with you know you can make a thousand speeches you can throw a ton of scientific data at people but what is, and it would probably make no difference but what is needed is for musicians to actually interpret that scientific data to interpret those speeches through the emotional language of music and touch the hearts and the souls of people you know and uh, and speak to the hearts and souls of people so that uh, because it's only an emotional connection that can bring about a difference so i'd like to conclude with you know this uh, this great senegalese philosopher baba diom he said that he said something that really stuck with me he said that you know that at the end of the day we as humans we will only protect things that we love because that's within our nature you know only things that we love are with our inner circle only things that we love we will protect we will only love things that we understand and we will only understand things that we are taught so i personally have made it my mission that through the powerful language of music i want everybody to fall in love with our natural world and hopefully through that love we'll find it within ourselves to conserve to protect and to sustain through our patriotism because at the end of the day india is much more than just human beings we always think of india as being human beings when we do a version of the national anthem or a version of vande mataram the only thing we show in the visuals are basically politicians actors actresses but india is much more than just humans because because our animals have existed on our land long before any humans have ever set foot here so basically india is basically our forests our wildlife and then our humans and i believe that if we can use our patriotism if we can use our culture if we can use our tradition our spirituality to protect the natural world of india then we ourselves survive and we make a much better future for our genera- for future generations so and i believe that music can be the catalyst and music can drive change so thank you so much thank you that was a, that was a, a wonderfully inspiring and, and of course shanti samsara was uh, was launched by prime minister modi and and president uh, francois hollande uh, at the uh, cop21 climate change conference in paris and i think there were some 500 musicians from at least 40 countries who participated in that uh, in that wonderful yeah actually after i won my grammy i was called for a meeting uh, which was supposed to be like a simple photo op with prime minister modi and then what happened was that uh, it ended up being an hour long conversation because we started speaking about the environment and he was going to be visiting the cop Uh, which is the largest ever climate change conference in the history of uh, largest ever conference of uh, of world leaders ever in the history of uh, mankind 195 world leaders came together to decide our future and to decide our carbon footprint and uh, so prime minister modi is the one who initiated that album he told me why didn't you make an album which has got musicians from all over the world and you know and uh, if i like it then i'll release it over there and you know and uh, we'll create awareness and that's what i did i created that album and uh, for 500 musicians from 40 countries and 
you know, Prime Minister Modi released it along with President Francois Hollande at the climate change conference. Wonderful, wonderful story. So uh, uh, we finally come to the to the to the last uh, of our wonderful uh, range of speakers, Dr. Sheila Patel. Uh, she, of course, and, and I think there's a beautiful segue uh, uh, because uh, she she is uh, Chief Medical Officer of Chopra Global, uh, Deepak Chopra, who brings spirituality and uh, modern science together uh, in a, in a wonderful way. So. Over to Dr. Sheila Patel. Koti ji, please can you play the video? Hello, hello and namaste to everyone out there. I am so honored to have been invited to be part of this celebration of Indian heritage and culture and how it has spread across the globe, uh, reaching you know distant corners of um, the planet in many different ways. And I grew up here in the US uh, as a uh, daughter of Indian immigrants. And so growing up, I certainly understood and appreciated the beautiful art, music, uh, you know, and other traditions that came from India, as well as uh, understanding the science and wisdom traditions, spirituality uh, that again comes from India and I'm so grateful to have had that foundation for living my life and it was only after I became a physician uh, so being an MD I was trained in the Western medical model here in the States and really didn't appreciate this amazing healing system of Ayurveda that was first described in India, as we know, thousands of years ago, and is just as applicable today, and perhaps more applicable today than ever before, as we've gotten more and more away from these foundational principles of healing that Ayurveda teaches us. And as a physician, I deeply understand the importance of modern medicine and when those tools are useful and used and still use many of the tools when unfortunately people have gotten to a state of acute illness and sometimes they can be useful but some at some point during my career i realized that the the western medical model and paradigm of waiting until we get sick really doesn't serve people. And I began a journey of looking to ancient healing traditions for how to actually not just prevent disease, but to stay healthy. And this is where Ayurveda is so unique and one of the really the most complete healing system that I came across in all of my studies. And it's been amazing to see the growth of Ayurveda again, across the globe, and especially here in the United States, where more and more people, uh, because of access and because of pioneers that began speaking about Ayurveda here in the West decades ago, now so many people are um, looking to access natural ways of healing. And Ayurveda, of course, in my opinion, is one that um, will really help to transform the health of not only individuals, but the entire planet. Uh, because Ayurveda is a consciousness-based approach to healing. And if there's anything we need more than ever, it is an elevation of consciousness all across the planet, reconnecting to this idea that we're all connected, reconnecting to the principles of nature and living lifestyles that are in alignment with nature. And uh, when I first made a transition, uh, of course, again, I still practice Western medicine, but made a transition to learning and practicing more of the principles of lifestyle medicine using the foundational principles of Ayurveda, I found that we can really translate this amazing, sophisticated, deep wisdom 
the science of life, the wisdom of life, into very practical tools and uh, you know lifestyle uh, routine that people can bring into their lives anywhere on the planet and any anywhere across time because the principles of ayurveda reconnect us to our natural healing ability and those are true everywhere on the planet one of the ways that i see ayurveda really uh contributing more than anything else to the health of the entire planet is through again bringing these teachings to everyone. You know, Ayurveda is made to awaken that inner knowledge that's within people. And this is certainly something that I've learned as uh, chief medical officer at Chopra Global, the mission, you know, of Chopra Global and the founder, Deepak Chopra, uh, who began talking about Ayurveda again many decades ago, and many other people who've been along on that journey, is to take this ancient wisdom, help people apply it in their lives, rather than making it inaccessible so that people don't think that they can apply Ayurveda to them and create personal transformation for the collective well-being. Because as we know, as each individual person heals and thrives and lives to their fullest potential, then the natural outcome of that is is wanting to help for the health of others and the planet. And that's certainly what I've noticed in, in our teachings. And so when I first began teaching at Chopra Global, I really began to develop a vocabulary as well as using the modern science that's validating these ancient uh, Ayurvedic principles and really realize that it can be made accessible to people. And I think these are some of the obstacles that we need to you know, collaborate and come together on to, uh, you know, really make this science of life, this lifestyle medicine, this this system to create health on a daily basis accessible to everyone. And in my teachings of Ayurveda, what I've done and what I continue to do and what we try to do at Chopra Global is uh, speak about Ayurveda in a way that explains people the whys behind all of the practices. You know, why Why should we live in alignment with nature? Why should I wake up at a certain time? Why should I do these practices every day? And this is the time, this is the time I think when we'll really see Ayurveda, um, you know, becoming more and more and more mainstream because a lot of the current science and, you know, physics and in biofield sciences where we're starting to be able to measure some of these more subtle aspects to our physiology that we couldn't really explain before, um, and even you know bioelectric devices that are being created to um, you know affect our physiology, we can use yoga. We can use some of these practices in Ayurveda to affect our own uh, you know neurological system or electrical system, and so now we're starting to have the language of science to be able to spread the wisdom of Ayurveda. Uh, and make it more accessible. Uh, and so I think that's one of my main objectives is to try to find a way to communicate Ayurveda using the core principles. We have to heal body, mind, spirit all together. We can't ignore any one of those aspects of our being, aspects of our experience as humans. So it is really the original mind, body, spirit medicine we have to look for the root cause of things. We can't just treat symptoms. We have to use the root, we have to look for the root cause and find ways to create lifestyles that address that root, root cause, that reduce inflammation, that reconnect us to our inner healing ability, removing the things that are interfering with that and bringing in nourishment so that our inner healing ability or self-regulation can, can actually uh, do what it's supposed to do. And we can use the principles of uh, keeping our digestion strong, for example. And now with all the sci current science in the microbiome, we're understanding finally in a modern context why Ayurveda always said digestion is the, you know, is the core to our health, that we need good digestion. And all of the amazing tips that are right in our kitchen, right at our grocery store that we can use to, uh, to optimize our digestion for our, for our health. 
we can use the six tastes that Ayurveda teaches us to use a variety of foods to heal. And nowhere, no matter where you live on the planet, I've found that you can, you can um, just look at what the foods are that are growing um, locally and in different places all around the planet and still use these basic principles of, that Ayurveda gives us. So it doesn't have to look a certain way. And this is very important to make this you know, global influence and, and help people to understand how Ayurveda can help improve their lives, the lives of their families and communities, et cetera. And aligning ourselves with, with the natural rhythms of, you know, the rhythms of nature, going to sleep at a certain time, waking at a certain time, eating at a certain time. And as a physician and scientist, uh, I appreciate again that all of these things are being validated more and more in modern science. And there really is a way to integrate. You know, we don't, it doesn't have to be one or the other. So I see the opportunity here, especially probably nowhere better than in India to collaborate, to work together, to be creative, and to find ways where Western medicine has really established itself and these deep roots of Ayurveda to come together and create a new paradigm for healing. I think this is so necessary right now, uh, everywhere uh, in the world, is to create a true a new uh, and a paradigm for healing that truly helps us thrive body, mind, spirit, and live to our fullest potential, awaken the consciousness within us, and uh, create a healthier, happier, more just, peaceful world. And I really see that Ayurveda, by teaching us how to live our lives consciously, uh, and the opportunity that we have right now to bring it everywhere on the planet is really going to help us, um, you know, transform ourselves and the entire planet. So I am very excited to be a part of this movement. And um, again, just to be able to share how I've used Ayurveda, I welcome people to join us, uh, you know, on uh, everything that we're doing at Chopra Global to help you know, make Ayurveda accessible. So thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here and excited to uh, continue to participate in all of the celebrations. So namaste. Namaskar. Thank you so much. That was really uh, yet another absolutely wonderful talk and uh, yeah, spiritually enriching uh, and hopefully healing in more ways than one. Uh, body, mind, and spirit healing, getting it all together. Um, if I could just uh, kick off the discussion by asking you uh, a, a question uh, about both the US and India. And uh, the uh, interesting thing about Ayurveda is that in India, Ayurveda is almost entirely confined to the tourists. You know, there, there's a big tourist element. People go to uh, resorts and hotels to get some Ayurvedic healing done. It's kind of a, it's kept in a little compartment. Uh, and I think quite similarly in the US, uh, getting full, um, full acceptance for alternative medicines is very difficult. Whereas for instance, in Germany uh, and in parts of Europe, uh, alternative medicines are, uh, alternative medical practices are much more acceptable. Uh, I think there is a there is of course a regulatory challenge uh, in India. I think the regulatory challenge comes from the fact that you often have quacks uh, who claim to be Ayurveda uh, professionals. So I suppose we need a system of uh, of certification uh, that is effective. Um, but uh, Ayurveda has enormous potential for good. Uh, how does one harness that best? Uh, Let's start with just harnessing it, harnessing it effectively in the United States and India. Yes, yes, thank you uh, for, you know, you bring up all of really the, the challenges that we have at this time. Uh, and, you know, I think a lot of it is, you know, although Ayurveda is so much deeper than the, you know, material science will probably ever show us, I think that's been just in, in my time studying Ayurveda and, you know, 
seeing how it's been taught over the years, we do have to have some science to validate, you know, some of the practices and, you know, and now we do have some of the things that at least give us a foundation to uh, take kind of the the woo woo or the, you know, the skepticism out of it. Although again, with whole systems, when you're studying lifestyle, our current science really isn't good for studying, you know, when you're doing multiple things at a time, but at least we can create some foundation in science to say, oh, there is some, some major effects on our genes. There are some major effects, you know, on our, you know, digestion hormonal system. And, and, and Ayurveda is addressing all of these things. Of course, I don't think we'll ever completely explain, you know, things with this reduction of scientific model that we use currently, but there are people that are trying to study whole systems medicine. So that's one thing is, you know, we have to play a little bit in the, in the, in the modern language of science to get some validation there. Uh, also, I think we have to shift the perception, right? That it's not only just, um, you know, foods that you eat or certain, you know, certain practices that it's this whole lifestyle medicine and that it is accessible. I think, you know, like, like many things that are new, um, people who have more accessibility to, uh, you know, uh, go outside of the medical system, for, for example, here in the States, you need a certain um, affluence to be able to do that. Um, and, and, you know, again, even many of my relatives feel like, oh yeah, Ayurveda, it's like traditional medicine, it's good for some things, but, you know, if you really get sick, you, you know, you need modern medicine. And, and I think a lot of these attitudes just need to be shifted, but it'll take time. And, uh, you know, I, I know there's a resurgence and there's lots of work being done in India to, to educate, you know, uh, the medical community, people. And because again, the roots of Ayurveda are for, for the common people, you know, like use the spices in your cabinet, use yourself with nature, and then you don't even need to use the, the physicians because you, you'll stay healthy and you won't get sick. And so I think education, and that's why we have several certification programs that um, we have teachers all around, all around the planet to, to kind of bring these teachings to, to people, again, that makes it easy for them to implement. And, you know, we have the National Ayurvedic Medical Association here. There are many regulatory bodies that are coming um, into fruition for that reason that you said that, that people can start to trust um, certain sources of the information. So, you know, it, it will take time, but um, I, I think it has nowhere to go but up because, you know, it is, it is the truth of our true healing process. And so, um, you know, there's this, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg with, um, you know, Ayurveda being yeah. spread. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I wish it would spread in India as well and become <laughs> much more part of the mainstream. I suppose it needs better regulation uh, here yeah. too. Uh, of course, in India, we have uh, Dabur, uh, uh, which, which tries to scientifically validate uh, Ayurvedic knowledge uh, in the form of modern medicine. Uh, Himalaya, to some degree, does something similar. Um, also introducing some elements of Unani medicine, etc. So uh, we, we we do have these traditions, but uh, they here too. I think they're they're kind of confined to uh, to the margins rather than uh, yes. rather than becoming yes. mainstream. And I think it will take time. And and I do agree. There do need to be regulations. You need to, you know just like in medicine, we have lots of regulations. Um, maybe too many sometimes, but um, you know because that can limit access as well. But, um, you know, again, for testing with products, you know, yes, the herbs can be very powerful, but we also want to make sure they're tested, etc. But there's a way to traverse that moving forward. And I, um, you know, I think it's bound to happen. Yeah. Uh, so mo moving away, if I could just take the discussion into the musical realm, uh, because we have two uh, wonderful musicians here. Um, uh, Indian, uh, Indian music is uh, is gradually is again I think somewhat you know the the, the link between Indian classical and and jazz is is uh, is an obvious one but um, uh, how can we really make Indian music uh, uh, and perhaps the fusion with jazz uh, more mainstream I mean what what, what are some ways that that could happen uh, perhaps George uh, and Ricky could address that Ricky are you here you also here? <clears throat> okay, well then I'll take <laughs> I'll take the first stab at it. I think one of the one of the great things that I recognize happening, at least in the United States, is that 
there's a young generation of musicians of Indian heritage in the United States, um, South Asian heritage actually in general, <clears throat> who are growing up within the Western musical realm and yet have the family and historical tradition of Indian music in their families. So they are, um, that generation is, is sort of expanding awareness of the music and bringing, let's say, a fresh, a fresh face to, to that. Um, you know, it's, it's always a challenge to present anything that's deep to the masses. Um, you know, and, and there's always a risk of, of watering it down. Um, I think the, the highest art forms are often, uh, are often a form that it takes a certain amount of education to appreciate. And I think, you know, that's, that's one of the places that, it, that, that we need to strengthen is, is educating young people about Indian classical music in India, Indian classical music in the West, jazz in the West, jazz in India, and 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 learning what the cultural significance of, of both of those forms are, in in both in in all in all places. So education is, you know, how we focus our education is a huge uh, component to developing audiences and then developing artists who are going to um, to understand. The history of the of the different musics. I mean, I, I, we see in India that classical music, Indian classical music, is um, is a niche music. I mean, the the audience for Indian classical music is something that has to constantly be nurtured and developed within India. Certainly here within the West, as well as as well as jazz. Jazz is a um, is a as far as sales is a niche art form here in the United States. In some ways, it may be more appreciated even in in other places in Europe, um, in India. You know, I, the, the many of the people who are um, supporting jazz in India are close friends of mine. People like Louis Banks, who've been, um, you know, the the kind of the found the fa the godfather of jazz in Mumbai certainly and in India for decades now. Um, yeah, so I would say education, education and exposure is is probably the first, the first step to keeping and developing an audience, and perhaps making it a bit more mass market rather than just sort of an an elite art form that only you know you know I I, I understand that <clears throat> education is essential to really be part of the parampara to be part of the uh, part, to be part of the tradition but i think it's also interesting that uh, classical music training classical dance training uh, has a huge impact on doing modern dance doing modern music i, I think if you think about uh, the music that comes out of bollywood it's influenced by the carnatic tradition the north indian musical traditions and uh, at least to some degree, there is a uh, there, there is a there is a link. <clears throat> I don't think too many uh, classical Indian musicians uh, have uh, have the the sort of elan of uh, Ravi Shankar uh, to to sort of mainstream classical music. I think uh, Ravi Shankar was remarkably successful, like Zakir Hussain. Uh, mm -hmm. I think is remarkably successful in uh, in in melding the classical with the modern uh, you know with jazz for instance and several of your your collaborators um, have done a great job of of melding the two but it's uh, it, it is it is of course a little bit challenging uh, but I think one of the aspects is that uh, you know perhaps music should become part of the curriculum uh, classical music, at least a little bit of training in classical music, should become part of the curriculum for all Indian children. It's part of the tradition. I mean, just like I think Ayurveda and awareness of Ayurveda needs to be part of the Indian education system, not just some little niche that only a few people get to know about. Uh, and 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 uh, you know, you you have people saying, "Oh, Ayurveda, uh, yeah, we could perhaps." use it uh, you know occasionally but not all the time sort of thing 
whereas you know similarly with classical music i think there there is a there is a need for greater awareness among the mass of people because that sounds right uh, it, it seeps and, and, in. It, yeah. and you and you do see that with yoga i mean you do mm -hmm. see 500 school children all out on the field doing their surya namaskar every yeah. morning so there is a way to bring deep uh practices to to the general population mm -hmm. but starting young is 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 really quite essential yeah, yeah. uh so uh coming to uh mr shoshani who had some very interesting uh ideas to begin with and one of the one of the points that you made uh which i thought was really quite fascinating and unique was the idea that liquid came to power in 1977 for the first time as did the bjp actually it wasn't the BJP in its current form, but its predecessor party, the Janata Party, which came to power. But it, there were a couple of uh, there were a couple of BJP, uh, uh, well, Jansung uh, ministers in that. But what is interesting to to me also is that you you talked about uh, the British influence. Now, the British influence is something that we in India don't particularly celebrate that much, even <laughs> though we speak that language all the time. Uh, we, we 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 speak that language. We are still trying to shed that language to some degree. Our, our courts still operate, our higher courts still operate only in English. Uh, but I think back to the fact that in England, after the Norman invasion for three centuries, 300 years, French was the national language of Britain. I think the British have forgotten this now. Um, so this happens. Uh, you know, we had English as the, Nash, as the official language in India still 75 years, 74 years later. Um, in Israel, you have Hebrew. I mean, I mean, what is interesting is that when when I when I was on a flight to uh, to to Tel Aviv from uh, from Delhi, uh, everybody on the plane was speaking Hebrew. Uh, hardly anybody was speaking English except the Indians. So uh, I, I think what India can learn a little bit from Israel is how you have uh, successfully revived a nearly dead language and taught that to everybody and made it not only the lingua franca, but, but really the language of, of everyday use. Whereas in India, we unfortunately have abandoned Sanskrit uh, and even the new education policy barely mentions Sanskrit. And I think that is one of the greatest cultural uh, and historical legacies of India that is still lost and is not being entirely used uh, despite the fact that Sanskrit has such a huge influence on so many languages around the world mm. uh, and, you know, historical influences. So perhaps, uh, uh, Mr. Shoshani, if you could address how Hebrew was revived so successfully uh, by the early Israeli state and what well, we could learn from it in India. Definitely it's a phenomena. Uh, I speak uh, Hebrew. My mother speaks uh, speak Hebrew and my grandmother uh, uh, speak Hebrew it's because of the Bible first of all this is the first idea but it's a phenomenon to revive a language it's something that uh, nobody can even uh, think how difficult it is it was a big fight in the beginning uh, between the Orthodox and the secular uh, people in Israel but it's a dramatic event in Israel but don't forget that in Israel, uh, uh, when David Ben-Gurion became the first uh, prime minister of Israel, he decided that because we are actually a country of immigrants, people, Jews from all over the world came to Israel, he decided that there is a united Israel, which means that everybody needs Hebrew names, Hebrew language, and even Hebrew culture. And it was not uh, easy in the beginning, it was a big uh, revolt of this idea in the beginning. Even today, it was uh, actually a big discussion in uh, our parliament in the Knesset. But I'm a creature, I myself, a creature of uh, this uh, uh, melting pot, and I'm uh, very proud of it. But um, I, of course, my parents were born in Israel and uh, not uh, as immigrants, but most of my friends, the, their parents were born out of Israel but my parents were born under the British mandate. Uh, then they are, I'm very, for me, it's very natural, yes. And uh, how do you think of Yehudi Menuhin 
as a as a musician is he, he the 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 great violinist uh, uh, his collaboration with Ravi Shankar really had a huge influence and and of course they they created uh, symphonies that uh, that melded Western and Indian classical traditions in a in a remarkable way. First of all, you're absolutely right. Yudi Menuhin is a, is a great uh, 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 musician, if I may say. And I think, uh, but uh, don't forget someone who is uh, in Israel, very, uh, in a very uh, far way, more familiar in Israel. And it's a Zubin Meta. Yeah. And he's, he's a fantastic, you know, he's, he's a celeb in Israel for many, many years. And if you mention the name India, Hodu in, in Hebrew, it's the name of India, it's Hodu. Everybody say, oh, Zubin Menta. Then, uh, then uh, and he came from a very Eastern Europe style of music. And uh, he combined it with the East, East, yes, uh, of India. And it's a, it's a combination, um, yes, but nobody, you know, in Israel, you have to, to be frank with you. In Israel, nobody knows, uh, not a lot of people knows who is Yudi Menuhin, unfortunately. <laughs> Zubin Meta, everybody knows. <laughs> yes, that's an interesting point because Zubin, Zubin Meta, of course, was uh, uh, the, the uh, conductor of the New York Philharmonic for, for many years, uh, but he, I, I think he, he truly also found his passion and his love with the Israeli, Israeli Philharmonic. And I think he brought the Israeli Philharmonic, Philharmonic Orchestra to uh, India on, a, on, a, on several occasions. You uh, absolutely so he are. has been a huge cultural bridge. And of course, he belongs to a, to a unique uh, community in India, the Zoroastrian community, which, um, which, is, uh, uh, which had to escape from or what is today Iran uh, at the time of the uh, at the time of the uh, Arab invasion and the founder found a refuge in Gujarat uh, and so they, they mainly have surnames that are Gujarati Mehta and Patel and so on uh, um, but uh, but of course they retain their, their a lot of their cultural traditions and I, I would say that Zoroastrianism is very much a part of the fabric of modern India as well. You know, we see that with the Tata group and with, uh, with other uh, great uh, business families as well. So I, I, I uh, thank you so much to all of the speakers. It's been a really wonderful experience uh, listening to all of you. Uh, I, we didn't get to talk too much more about water, but water uh, was, uh, you know, the management of water is something that India has learned a great deal from Israel, and especially in uh, in drier states like Gujarat, where where Prime Minister Modi uh, uh, used many of the techniques uh, from drip irrigation and so on in Israel. Um, but uh, music as the universal language was uh, was what uh, George Brooks told us about, and uh, uh, but it's it's a universal language. But within that, uh, the role of Indian classical and jazz. Uh, and, the, and the melding of the two, as well as classical, uh, Western classical, I think that uh, is, is, is really representative of the universal, universality of music as a, as a language of, of love and, uh, and, and creativity. Uh, and of course, Ricky Cage, I don't know if he's still here. Ricky, are you still there? Uh, maybe we've lost him for some reason, but uh, you know, he, he, he did a fabulous job of showing how music and the environment can come together to two aspects of India's contribution to the world that, um, that have uh, 5,000 years at least of history behind them. And, and I think they, he, he, he wonderfully embodies uh, the, 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 the melding of, uh, of the environment and music. And finally, of course, we had uh, spiritual healing from Dr. Sheila Patel, uh, who, who, who showed us uh, how Ayurveda uh, brings mind, uh, body, and soul together uh, as, as a healing tradition. And, uh, uh, and those are, you know, those, that, that is yet another aspect of, of India's potential soft power 
that I think uh, India is doing very little so far to fully uh, to fully build on. And part of I think part of building that is is enabling Ayurved to become part of the medical uh, medical system in India. Uh, for instance, uh, if it had been, perhaps we would have dealt with COVID much more effectively, both in the first and the second wave. Anyway, so that is, uh, 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 that uh, to me, that was just uh, an absolutely wonderful uh, session to, to be listening to these amazing uh, voices of creativity, of science, of, um, uh, of the Judaic tradition, all of that, uh, and, uh, and, and learning how India uh, and its soft power can engage the world. So thank you very much, all, uh, all, all of the speakers. Uh, and I hand it over now to uh, uh, Arunya Gupta. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, I don't think my vote of thanks can do justice to what President Jiti just said. Uh, he's absolutely right at each and every point, and I completely agree with him. Thank you so much, Mr. George Brooks, Dr. Sheila Patel, uh, Mr. Kobe, uh, Ricky Cage, who's left us, but we wish to, to, for him to be here with us right now. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Prasenjit. I mean, the way you actually hit the right note, you know, connecting music, connecting Ayurveda, connecting language, connecting diplomacy, all of it together. And I think that there couldn't have been a better start to this festival. Um, thank you to all our audience who joined us. Uh, before we sign off for today, uh, I'll just uh, inform about tomorrow's session. In the morning, we have a session on Jnana, Vedanta and Oneness. And in the evening, we have another exciting session on traversing dimensions. So understanding India through its museums. Uh, please join us and we hope to have you with us in the upcoming sessions. Thank you so much to all the panelists, to the Indian Council for Cultural Relations, to Indic Academy, and of course, to all the teammates here. Thank you so much. Koti ji, could you please play the national anthem for us? Shubha Ashishama